I frequently get on about not ransacking historical sites like abandoned mines. The justifications that people give for their theft are as absurd as, for example, you'll hear the same person argue that it's bad to steal from Roman ruins or a Native American site, but perfectly fine as historical mine sites, or, oh well, the things will just be buried forever if I don't steal them, as if archaeologists don't excavate things all the time. However, I realize that many in the general public don't fully comprehend what is being lost at these sites. So I made this video at a mine, that's where these pictures are from as well, by the way, at a mine that has not been ransacked so that you can see what these thieves are taking from you. You see the gated attics and stripped decaying buildings when you visit an abandoned mine, but many don't understand just how much used to be there. This is an example of what used to be there. It doesn't have to be that way, but someone's stupid desire to have an ore car in their front yard or an artifact in their garage that their kids either won't care about or won't know what it is and will throw it away as junk is why so often when you go out to these historical abandoned mine sites, you don't see anything. There's three compressors remaining. Um, this is a RAND uh, steam powered type 10. That's a Sullivan um, angle compressor or L-shape or L-type compressor. It's, it's like an L. And that one down there is an Ingersoll Rand um, Imperial Type 10. And that one's electric. And this Sullivan would have been electric as well, but the motor's gone. Why did they have three redundancy? They needed a lot of air. This compressor right here, the Type 10, is, or the, the, the electric Type 10, is still definitely runnable. Mm. Um, and these Type 10s are probably the most common compressor you'll see out in the West. So yeah, they converted this to electric um, later on. From steam? Yeah, from steam. Um, you can see the V-belts uh, laying off to the side there um, that they had on this flywheel. Um, this flywheel originally uh, wouldn't have meant to have been driven. Um, but uh, they just disconnected the steam cylinders and uh, put some belts around the flywheel and put a motor on that foundation you see right behind you and ran it off the motor. Is this the steam? So the steam would come in right there. You see the flywheel governor, uh -huh. the two balls? Steam would come in there. This is air out. And they've disconnected all this for some reason. Um, but it's a, it's a two-stage compressor. Um, you got two two cylinders. Uh, you see they're different sizes. The air is first sucked into uh, this low pressure cylinder. Um, in there, it's pressurized to about 30 psi. Then it's sent to the high pressure cylinder and pressurized to about 100 psi. And from there, it's going to the drills. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, governor still turns. What that would do is it would stop the, uh, the steam. But these, these are steam cylinders right here. Mm -hmm. So the steam would be put in through, through there, go into the valve chest, and run, the, run the steam cylinders. Um, and so with that governor, what you would have is, uh, you see those uh, little pulleys on the side? Yeah. Yeah. So those would be kind of used to, to hold on to the belt, and it would run up to the pulley you see that's um, on the bevel gear there. Or at least I don't know if the pulley's still on it. Yeah, it should be right there. Yeah. Um, and from there, you'd have a really small belt running down um, to the, uh, you'd either go to the, I think it would probably just go to the, sh the, uh, the shaft next to the flywheel, although they could have put it on the flywheel. Anyway, um, that's going to cause these balls to spin around as it's, as it's running. And um, centrifugal force is going to lift the balls outwards the faster they spin. And there's a little thing in here, kind of a plunger, that pushes down as the balls lift up. So you can see, as these, oh, they can't go up anymore. Yeah. Anyway, as these go up, it would push down. And this right here is your steam intake. And so it would uh, close a valve in here as it got faster. And so it regulates itself that way. Gotcha. And then this big weight right here, you would set this to... Um, to help uh, kind of set your governor, you could set the speed of the governor. Right. You know, by having that additional weight. But yeah, fly, finding a fly ball governor is pretty pretty rare out here. Yeah. Do you know what they had on this big foundation over here? Um, that, so I heard that used to be, there used to be a single drum voice there. 
Okay. And this used to be the hoist house. And if you look out up, uh, I think you can see either like the remnant of the window. I don't know where he, huh. I really don't see where the rope would have been running out of. But I had heard they had a, a single drum hoist here and they were hoisting on, the head frame was facing this way. Okay. But they turned the head frame that way and put the hoist over there when they got a double drum. Interesting. Um, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's what, uh, what, what, what happened there, but that kind of looks like it could have been a compressor foundation too. Like another yeah, I was compressor. curious. So all this equipment dates to the early days? It was put in around, it would have been 1910, 1915 or so. Okay. And then they, it would have, uh, it would have, they, the last time, this was probably the last compressor run. Okay. And so this was probably shut off for good in about 1950. Okay. Yeah. So one thing you might notice on, on they're, they're both, they both say um, type 10 on them. This compressor is a steam driven compressor. Yeah. Um, but one of them says Ingersoll Rand and the other one just says Rand. Yes. Um, that's because the, uh, the Ingersoll Sargent Company and the, the Rand, uh, I think it was Rand Proctor, it was Rand, uh, Rand Company, they merged um, in 1905. Okay. So that compressor there was made before 1905, that's this pretty, one after. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. I think it's, is it, is it oh, oh, horsepower? 150. These uh, type 10 compressors right here came in different sizes. Um, this is kind of the mid size. You'll see bigger ones. I think this is about a six foot flywheel on it. Um, what they were, what they'd really, they'd sell them by is the diameter of the pistons. Um, but it's a lot easier to look at the flywheel. And yeah. It kind of, it kind of lines up with how big the piston is usually. Um, so there, you see ones with like uh, eight foot flywheels, I think sometimes, with the bigger ones. That's nuts. But this is kind of the mid-sized one. And um, yeah, it would still run great. They're really simple. Um, there's not, not a whole lot to go wrong with them. Uh, it's gonna waste a lot of power though compared <laughs> to a modern one. A lot of drills. Yeah. There's like all different eras too from the look of it. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Some of them look, uh, a lot of them look like about the same model. Let's see. Oh, drill steel. I made this one. Gardner De so these are Gardner Denver's right here. That's a Gardner Denver. You know, I think these might all be the same Gardner Denver. Oh, that one's different right there. Looks like someone turned it into a uh, plugger drill. That's one that you operate just by hand, you know, holding on to. Huh. That's a pretty heavy plugger drill. Either that or they just put the handle on it or something. Oh, so many drills. Something real neat. If you go back around here, um, you can see uh, some of the shipping crates that this put. Oh, is that what that is? Yeah, right down here, this, um, this is a spare high pressure head and piston for that compressor right there. And then if you look down around here, you can see, I remember seeing fragments of crate, crates that said Ingersoll Rand on them. That's really cool. Uh, two rods are connecting out to operate your valves on your cylinders. So there's a, the valves up there and the valves down here. And these are kind of, I guess they're like, it's a coreless valve, I guess. It's kind of a little, uh, it's rotating back and forth. Okay. A little cylinder. Um, but then connected to it right here, you see they have this little arm and it runs up to this oiler and it cranks, it cycles the oiler like this. And this oiler is a little pump 
And every time um, that cycles, it pumps out a precise amount of uh, grease into um, each one of these little brass tubes. And then these run to all of the different uh, parts that need to be greased permanently on the, on the machine. Huh. And then you have some parts, like right here, that just have grease, grease cups on them. Yeah. Um, and those you got to do by hand. But this oiler makes it a lot easier. We were just looking in there before. We'll do this room in a minute. But in the meantime, I want to check out this shop. So this is the blacksmith shop. It's a cool little wooden uh, mm -hmm. barrel right there. I'm sure this guy would have been busy. Yeah. Would have been loud in here. Yeah. Thought. Yeah. Yeah, the drill press is still. Oh, it still works? Yeah. That does, wow. Yeah. Um, but so uh, a lot of stuff have been stolen from this shop and pretty recently. That's too bad. Um, but there's still some basic pieces here. Uh, we have an anvil on that stump right there. Maybe another anvil right here, I'm not sure. Um, this machine right here is your drill sharpener or your steel sharpener. Um, what you have pretty much right here is just a pneumatic hammer. And um, what you would do is you would take, let's find a piece of steel to sharpen. Um, there's only steel around here. Here's the bit for it. I'm going to try to find one that, uh, that isn't six feet long. This is a pain out of mine and can't find some drill steel. <laughs> There's some in the compressor. Okay. Well, even if people have come out and stolen stuff, there's still a lot of cool stuff here. I'm just sorry they did that though. Demonstrate how to sharpen the steel. Yeah, that should be interesting. Yeah, so we know when you're ready. I'm ready. Okay. So the steel right here, take it and you heat it up in the forge until it's red hot, or hot enough at least to start molding it. Um, the steel dulls over time, uh, drilling through rock. Right. Um, so you, you want to sharpen it fairly regularly. Um, if you don't, it just the drill gets really slow. Um, then you would take this, uh, you take this steel, and you would take one of these bits. Okay. You can see right here how the bit fits onto the end of the steel. Yeah. So it's just a reverse of this drill steel. Gotcha. You put the bit inside the chuck. Right in here. I get over there. Uh, I can't. I can't change the, the chuck on it, or or can't change the uh, change the bit because these bolts are you know, been been here for eight years. <laughs> um, but if you imagine that bit being in there, then you would take your drill steel, put it in, and you would um, use one of the levers. I th I'm not sure which one it was being. Maybe the foot lever. Anyway. Um, you'd use that to press this uh, clamp down, and it would hold it. Okay. Then the other one would turn on this uh, this hammer. Or the, it's just you know, it's like Pneumatic a little, hammer, yeah. Yeah, a little hammer, and it would hammer it into uh, the desired shape. Yeah. That would have been something to see. Yeah. Yeah. From what I heard, they were really, really loud. I was just—I'm just imagining loud and you know sparks flying everywhere. Yeah. Pieces of molten metal should be cool. But it's a lot better than sharpening it by hand. Uh, I would think so. But you'll see—you've probably seen these drill sharpeners around before. Yeah. 
I've seen uh, seen some even older than that, actually. Mm, yeah. And then uh, the room we came in through, you said that was the machine shop? Yeah. Um, That's where we started out, yeah. in there. So this right here is for bending sheet metal, kind of you know, rollers to make a curve in it. Gotcha. Um, and then you got your lathe. That is a big lathe. And then down here, this is a newer, um, it's probably from the war, uh, bearing press. And that right there, I'm pretty sure, is the rotor for a pump. And You're so they were on. probably pu pushing something onto that, onto that rotor. Hmm. That's why it's sitting there. Yeah, I just left it. Yeah, waiting for somebody to finish the job. Yeah. And then over here we've got an equipment room. Each of those slots would have a part that would be used in the mine. See some core samples and such over there. But uh, what I'm talking about here, as you see, I've got labels for all the parts. sizes and such. So somebody would come in here and need a part, have it assigned to them, check out to them, whatever. You got your sleeves, your elbows, your nipples, your plugs, your tees, unions, valves. What's cool is a lot of this stuff is still here. Boots. No boots left. This is cement in both eyes, <laughs> cutting slusher cable, slush, piece of cable went into eye, Christ. A lot of eye injuries. Yeah. Pinch, pinch bar slipped and struck his head. Jack slipped and hurt hand. Wrench slipped and hurt third finger on left hand. It's pretty specific. This is in 1944. Sprained back. Piece of cable in left eye. Dirt came off cable into left eye again. Christ. So many eye injuries. Dropped something onto finger. Piece of cable in left. Oh, so some of these are repeats. Car run over left foot. Oh boy. No lost time. <laughs> Bruise on left hand, little finger. 
they don't say what just just happened. Spring the right wrist. I like these the more detailed ones. More. Nine year old boy here. Nine year old boy, what the hell is he doing here? He got a small cut on the back of the head. And a slight dislocation of third vertebrae. What the heck? Wow, he got. He was mucking. Man, what's the date on that? 1941. That a nine year old boy mucking in 1941. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. See, so far, the vast majority of these have been uh, people straining themselves. Yeah, think about what you're working with, it makes sense. Yeah, like right here, was attempting to dump a car waste, when a car shifted, causing the end to sprain an ankle. Just stuff like that. Yeah. And I guess stuff like that, they ask if it could be prevented, not so much. There was one though where a guy hit his head on the roof, and it sounds like that one could not have, that one sounds like it could have been prevented. Yeah. But they don't say that, they just don't write anything in the <laughs> These are the uh, order tickets here. As you can see, there are a lot of them. He was just reading out some of the accident reports. Uh oh. This one's got a long. <laughs> this one's got a long one. What's the story on that one? Cap was dipped in black moisture sealing compound, and bright cap was not easily visible. Wrong end of fuse was placed in powder. In split or in spitting fuse, this miner. Spits fuse for timing holes away from the end without cutting it off. Fuse burned from both ways from point of lighting and ignited the cap within a few inches of his hands. Ooh. Badly lacerated palm in all fingers of right hand and second third of fingers in left hand. So it sounds like it wasn't. They said he was probably back in two weeks. So. Not bad. Having a blasting cap go off right near your hand. Yeah, no kidding. Oh, here's the, um, like, the minimum wage. Oh, that's interesting. Mining. Read that out. So for this mine, it looks like the minimum wage. Gosh, no. Mining. Oh. 7.20 a day. $7.20 a day. Wait, that might be wrong. Effective 1935. I don't know if it's, it doesn't say today or per hour. Hmm. Per hour, that's pretty good. That's really good for 25, or for 35, right? Yeah, for 1935. It's almost 100 years ago. So I'm guessing it's per day. That's neat. I mean, for minimum wage, you know, that's not bad. Holy, here's a list of all of the jobs they had at the mine. Oh, you want to read that out? Yeah. Or at least these are all the... These look like... Yeah, these are all the jobs. So yeah, I can read that. Yeah, that would be interesting. Blacksmith, blacksmith's helper, chief electrician, electrician, electrician's helper, fireman, compressor man, hoist man, um, and they had a separate hoist man for surface, and I guess there was an underground hoist here as well. Head machinist, machinist, Mechanic slash welder, mechanic helper, underground mechanic, underground mechanic helper, um, a pump man at the 1400 and the 840, which doesn't make sense because they didn't have a 1400, truck driver, truck driver helper, janitor, surface laborer, sawyer, uh, head, sawyer helper, top man, top trammer, Warehouse man, assistant engineer, sampler, head sampler, cager, miner, mucker, motor man, motor man helper, tugger man, timber man, timber man helper, and pipe and track repair man. So we were just looking in there, and now we have this room. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um... The mine, when it was at its peak, they had a, some big boilers, like, you know, locomotive-sized boilers, um, to, to generate electricity here on site. Okay. Um, no one really knows, though, exactly where those were. They were probably buried by the dump later on. Ah. Uh. Um, there's, or the, the site of them, they probably were scrapped out and buried. But uh, these right here are just boilers for the dry. Um, so these would have been heating up your radiators. Huh. And these would have been warming your showers. Gotcha. 
These are pretty beefy by themselves, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's incredible with the gauges and all the fittings on them. Absolutely. Um, and to, uh, let's see. But yeah, to, to run these, they would have had these fuel pellets you can see on the floor. That you yeah, on. yeah. They're old, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not common. Um, I'm fairly certain that was pretty much just a hot water tank. Okay. It's it's really beefy, but it could have been an air receiver tank before, and they just repurposed it. it. Yeah. What are we seeing here? So this is the dry, um, this is you know the miners changing room. Um, this was built I think around 1910-ish and um, the mine uh, would have used it up until about 1927 I guess is when they shut down and then they reused it all in the 40s and huh. uh, early in, until about 1950. Um, this machine right here off to our right, the big green thing, is kind of a mystery. No one knows really what it does or why it's here. Yeah, I was wondering about that myself. Um, it was probably put in in like the 60s or 70s and uh, just one of the people in the family wanted to build something and so they they put it in this empty building. Okay. Um, huh. But uh, the best guess that I heard for what it is is an electrostatic separator because you got these sheets of plexiglass and then you have those felt pads on the top. Okay. So those run along the top, and then down below you have a trough for material. So maybe they're trying to do some sort of separation that way, but hmm. why, I think, is, is going to have to remain a mystery. Sounds like a good explanation to me. Yeah. I guess these are the lockers for the miners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or they Some lock still on them. Hey, right, that's cool. But yeah, all original building, at least. <laughs> uh, some of this stuff looks pretty old to you. Yeah. Kind of has a bit of a mill smell in here. I think that's from this pile of stuff. Uh, it makes you feel at home, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Up here is one of the dry baskets. You see it on the wall right there. Oh, I totally missed that. Yeah, so someone's just, just hanging it there for, yeah. for storage for now. But originally, up on the ceiling, there would have been, um, you see those hooks up there. Yeah, they all have been hanging off of that, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'd have a, a pulley, and then you'd run the line down and tie it off to the wall. So they might have tied it to one of these nails or tied it to, you, you'll see like a bench in the center of these a lot of time that um, in these dries. Um, and so they would, they'd, uh, or not tie it down, they'd, they'd hook it down. And so you would uh, just lower your basket down when you need it. And this is still done in almost all underground mines today. The same, same style of basket and everything. Hmm. Um, it'd be really hot in here. They got a lot of radiators. Um, the, these are newer radiators from when it was reworked in the 40s. Okay. I was wondering um, about those. Yeah, but it's, uh, they tried to keep this as dry as possible so your clothes would be bone dry by the next shift. That's a worthy goal. Yeah. And uh, the old desk. So that's the main hoist. It's surprisingly big. It's a 300 horsepower. That's huge. Yeah. Um, and uh, to, um, to run it, there's all your electrical stuff. <laughs> um, this little compressor right here is kind of interesting. This hoist had uh, air brakes and air clutches on it. Huh. 
um, they're just too, it was too heavy to, to work, to actuate it by hand, you know? Makes sense, yeah. Um, and so, uh, normally your, um, your brakes would be taking air from the main compressor house. Okay. But if you wanted to just run your hoist and not your big compressors, you'd use this little compressor. And this little compressor was for the, uh, the brakes. Ah, uh, okay, I got you. Having a double drum hoist is a lot more efficient and a lot safer than a single drum hoist. Um, because you can see you have one cable is overshot and the other one is undershot coming off the drums. Oh yeah. And they're on a single drive shaft. Huh. The gear that drives them is, uh, right here in the middle. So okay. it's under this cover. Gotcha. And, um, this, uh, the idea with it though is that, um, when you have one cage going up, getting pulled up, yeah. the other one's being lowered down. So you have a counterweight effect. That saves a lot of energy. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, also, uh, almost you could say more importantly as far as safety, um, if you're lowering a heavy load like a piece of equipment uh -huh. and you have um, you can have another cage coming back up, it'll save your brakes. Oh, that makes sense. One of the biggest mines in Montana, the, the, the Ruby Shaft up in Phillipsburg, they uh, burned down their hoist house because they had a single drum flat rope hoist. It got too hot. And yeah, the brakes caught on fire. Jeez. So you got to be... Uh, Careful with single drum hoist. Conscientious of that, yeah. Yeah. But pretty rare hoist from what I can tell. It's a Wellman Seaver Morgan. Never even heard of them. Yeah. I hadn't before I saw this one. It's uh, not a very common brand around here, you know? Yeah. Um, so these, uh, these big clock looking things, you know, are your depth indicators. And so they're geared... To, to the drum, there's a bevel gear, and then they're geared down in there. Huh. And so, um, as the drum moves, this will uh, point towards the level. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Um, it's not absolutely precise, though. Um, you can't you can't rely on it to because to roll an ore car in one of these cages, it has to be absolutely flush. You know. Yeah, yeah. And over time, your rope stretches and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so what you do for that is you see right here this uh, white arrow on the drum. Uh, oh, that one has one too, sorry. Um, so you see the white arrow on that? Yeah. Um, so that is probably, um, or you see it's, it's on a little white line right there. So they would have run it down and communicated with the underground guys with the bells. When it was perfect. When it was perfect. And then when it was perfect, they would have marked that line there. So gotcha. they know exactly where to line it up. But you still got to use the bells because over time it's going to Shift stretch. and adjust, yeah. yeah. It's amazing how much this, this wire rope will stretch. Is it? Huh. Yeah. So that, that's amazing to me that the chair is still here. Yeah. The hoist operator's chair right there. Um, this right here is your uh, your signal bell. So you'd flick that to signal. Oh, okay. Um, which I think it is. <laughs> um, and then for these, each, uh, each drum has its own brake and its own clutch. Um, don't know which is which on this, but these... One of these would be brake, the other one would be clutch. Huh. And um, your clutch isn't used for like what you use a clutch for in a car to start and stop that much. Um, at least starting on an empty load, you really wouldn't need it. Um, your clutch is, is mainly to let one drum slip or um, let one drum move and the other one stay in place. And that lets you change the level that you're hoisting from. I just crawled under there to get inside the uh, head frame here. You can see an operator would have sat there in that chair. I'm amazed it's still there. You can see the hand controls here and uh, the different rail junctions. So there's one, two, and a third one over there. I know the light's terrible right now, but unfortunately there's nothing I can do about that. Here's looking down. That's the cage down there. And then of course the shaft is underneath that. Dropping down for quite a way. Sorry about the wind, there's not much I can do about that either. So the shaft is there and waste rock could go out in that direction and then the good stuff, the ore, would come around behind me here. It's really these tracks converge and come out here and they connect to this ore bin here. You see all those chutes coming off the ore bin? And if you look down over here, that's all ore. That is completely full of ore. I'm amazed this is still standing. To, if the wind's bad enough, I'll just dub this in later. But looking ahead, 
there is an ore cart. That's pretty cool. Unfortunately, there were seven here at one time, but uh, they were stolen. Some were stolen, some were pushed down the shaft, unfortunately. So this is the only one left, which is why it, uh, it's got to be kept the way it is, locked up like that. Again, you can see the ore down through there. Just another perspective on where we came from. Kind of a cool shot with the ore cart in the foreground. All right, we're back at the head frame. You remember we were walking through that building earlier and uh, walked across there just above. And actually looked down through there to the shaft here. And this is the... Uh, See the twin compartments right there, and that just drops down for a very long way, hundreds and hundreds of feet below. Pretty cool. That's ground level way up there. You can see a drift that was running there before it's consumed by the pit. That is a large owl right there. Give you a sense of size. You see drifts running off in different places. There's a ladder dropping down from a shaft that was there. It's now been exposed. Huge, huge sight. There's my buddy for a sense of scale. That's tough with the light too. Right there, it's kind of interesting. You can see the, that ladder right there is where a shaft uh, was run down and then that's been consumed by the pit. Started there and uh, just another view down here. You can see the uh, shaft right there runs up there. And then also uh, there's one right there. You see the bottom of. That's pretty cool. And then uh, behind that slab right there is uh, a ladder leading down into an abyss. It's not in very good shape, but uh, you do wonder what's down there. It's supposed to be an ore cart down there. I'm not sure what else. This one, uh, that runs back about 10 feet and then stops. You can see an ore chute back there. It's kind of cool. But yeah, it runs back there and just stops. And uh, maybe there was something down there, but it's all uh, filled in now. It's like rail right there, actually. I wonder if that connect. Oh, yeah, see the rail right there, too. Obviously, that connected across there at one time back in the day.